Greetings in the Lord. My name is Father Tom Legere, and I'd like to welcome all of you spiritual journeyers here this evening as we continue on with our series called The Spiritual Journey. Tonight we are coming to you from Vasey Theater at Villanova University. And tonight we will be speaking about some of the features of the midlife crisis and most importantly, how one is able to get out of a midlife crisis once you find yourself in it. Later on, you in the audience will have an opportunity to ask plenty of questions, so start thinking. But first, we will take a break and then we'll be right back. Relive the events in Rome when Philadelphia's Archbishop Anthony Bevilacqua became Cardinal. The Philadelphia Pilgrimage, Seven Days in Rome, chronicles the Cardinal's journey on videotape, with highlights from the consistory and the bestowal of the Red Beretta, the Masses at St. Peter's Square, and the Cardinal's titular church. To order your tape, please send a check or money order for $22.95 to Rome Video, the Delaware Valley Catholic Office for TV and Radio, 222 North 17th Street, Philadelphia, PA, 19103, or call 587-3775. Without a doubt, the midlife crisis always involves some crisis of meaning, values, and goals. And what does that mean? At a certain point in our lives, we usually set goals for ourselves. Maybe when we're very young, we've decided but by the time I'm 40 or 50 or 60, I would have liked to achieve X, Y, or Z. And at a certain point in your life, you realize that maybe you're never going to be able to achieve the goals that you set for yourself when you're younger. You will then have to come to terms with the fact that you will probably just end up dying as an ordinary person. You'll never have your picture on the cover of Newsweek. No streets will be named after you. And therefore, you have to find meaning deep inside oneself. Because you've come to the conclusion that you're not going to find that meaning that you're looking for by external accomplishments. Now, the flip side of this is that perhaps, and this is a situation that I think is peculiar to the culture that we live in, perhaps you actually have attained the goals that you set for yourself when you're younger. You were convinced that if I could only find the right partner and have the right job and have material security and all those things, then automatically I'm going to be happy. But yet, maybe you have all those things in your life. However, you've come to the conclusion that you're still not happy. And now what do you do? That's really panic city. If you never have the goals, then you can always delude yourself with the thought that, well, if I would have attained the goals, then I would have been happy. But if you have those things and you're still not happy, then where do you go? You go within. That's the only place where you find that happiness that the heart is really looking for. Another feature of the midlife crisis is that of loneliness. Perhaps up until now, whenever we have gone through any kind of an experience, there's always been somebody there to hold our hand. The person that we're in love with, a good friend, there's always been somebody there that we could share our experiences with. But when it comes to taking this leap of faith, this big transformative step in one's life, no one can do it for you, and in a sense, nobody can even do it with you. Martin Luther said there are only two things that we have to do alone in our lives, believe and die. No one can do those things for us. So that often gives us a deep sense of loneliness. There is 
However, when one can come through an experience like this, a deep sense of wisdom and power that we are able to attain. Not power over other people, but power to be with other people. When we have faced the darkness in ourselves, when we have faced our own ambiguity, when we have looked into the void and still been able to come out of it alive and reasonably sane, then we have real kind of power that can sustain us for a lifetime. We have wisdom that is much different than book knowledge. When I look at myself in my own life and I look at all the twists and turns of my own spiritual journey, all the mistakes that I've made, all the pain that I've felt, I don't regret any of it. And I wouldn't trade any of it for anything, simply because of the fact that this enables us then to really experience what other people are going through. It would be easy without this just to give quick answers to people. But when you have been through a crisis like this and you have been able to live to tell about it, then, as they say, you've been there. You have credibility. And so then, when we have gone through this kind of an experience, we begin to get a sense of what the spiritual journey is really all about. The last time we came together and spoke about the midlife crisis, we said then that what it's really all about is a journey within to get in touch with the spirit that is within us all. You can find all the happiness in the world out there on the physical level or the mental level, but this is one of the things that I believe very deeply, the only thing that can ultimately satisfy the deepest cravings of the human heart is spiritual meaning. You can take all of the crash courses and self-enlightenment that one can find. You can read all the books and listen to all the tapes, go through all the experiences that one can possibly think of. But in the final analysis, the only thing that really gives us ultimate happiness is that which we discover deep inside ourselves. These then are the features of the spiritual journey. However, as of yet, we haven't really said anything about how we are able to bring all of this to a conclusion. We haven't really said yet how it is that we are able to find some kind of meaning in our lives when all of this seems to be falling down on top of our heads. Well, when we come back, that's what we're going to be speaking about. How one can end this journey successfully and how one can turn what appears to be often a chaotic situation in the middle of a person's life into, in the final analysis, the best thing that has ever happened to us. And so we'll be right back and we will continue on with our spiritual journey. From the Vatican to St. Hubert's, from Saudi Arabia to Mayfair, the Catholic Standard and Times, the official newspaper of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, brings the world into your home each week. The Standard provides a Catholic overview of events around the globe and in your neighborhood. For just 36 cents an issue, you can keep your family informed from a Catholic perspective, formed in its faith and inspired by the lives of others. The Catholic Standard and Times, serving more than one million Catholics in the Delaware Valley, make it your favorite newspaper. Ah, uh, excuse me. I want to give blood. 
You're in the right place. Come with me. I heard about those people in the accident. I just want to help. Great. How are they doing anyway? Well, last we heard, they're going to be just fine. You know, it's a good thing you guys were there. No. It's a good thing you are here. Call the American Red Cross. Your neighbors need you. When we are undergoing a spiritual journey, one of the most important things is for us to accept what is happening. There will be, first of all, a tendency within ourselves to deny the fact that we sense being called to a transformation in our lives. And so consequently, what we will often do is throw ourselves into our work like we've never done before. Because we have this belief that if I can just keep busy, keep running 24 hours a day, then I won't hear the call within. I get up in the morning, I turn on the radio, and I go to work, and I'm running around here and there, and I come home, and I can't relax. I have to push myself and go, go, go. Oftentimes, what's going on here is really just denial on our part and an unwillingness to accept the fact that we're now called to a deeper change within. In addition, we will have our so-called friends who will tell us when we feel we're called to undergo a change that if we could really just get back to our same old self, then we'd be happy again. And of course, the point is precisely that you don't want to become your same old self. There's nothing wrong with that as far as it goes, but now it's time to move on. It would kind of be like a caterpillar refusing to become a butterfly. There's nothing wrong with being a caterpillar, but nature wants a transformation to take place and for a butterfly to emerge. And Nature and God are asking us to accept our own spiritual transformation rather than run away from it. Secondly, and I think this is very important, watch out for what I would refer to as counterfeit destinations. What does that mean? When you're going through a process of turmoil and change, it hurts. And human nature doesn't want to accept the fact that we hurt because of something that we're going through. So what we often do then is we project our pain onto somebody else. And we say to that person, often the person that we are in closest relationship with, I'm unhappy. It must be your fault because it's your job to make me happy. Well, one of the things that I'm very sure about in life is the fact that no one else can ever make us happy. No thing can make us happy. No person can make us happy. That only comes from inside ourselves. But because we don't want to face that, what oftentimes happens in the middle of a person's life is that they will conclude I'm unhappy, the person that I'm with is not making me happy, and so therefore I have to find somebody who will make me happy. And so you jump out of one relationship into the next with the false belief that some other person out there is going to make you happy. And of course you jump into that relationship and you find out that you have laid an impossibly heavy burden on somebody else's shoulders and they can't make you happy. And then maybe, if you're lucky, you start waking up and realizing that this is something that can only come from inside a person. I've also seen this over the years with a lot of priests and sisters that I've known who have left the ministry. Some, I think, really felt called to move on. But there were at least some, some, who perhaps were really going through 
a spiritual crisis, but didn't understand that that's what it was really all about. And so had the belief that maybe if I get married or maybe if I go do this or move to this part of the country, then I'm going to be happy. And of course, it doesn't work. You just take your unhappiness and you bring it into another relationship. So I think it's very important for us to watch out for counterfeit destinations in trying to get out of the midlife crisis. Thirdly, we bring this kind of a crisis to an end by recommitting ourselves to our path of life or at this point in our life discerning a call to perhaps move in a different direction. It is a fact that many people in the middle of their lives feel that this is an opportunity and a chance for them to move in a different direction. They change jobs, they move into a different part of the country, whatever. But those things are just kind of icing on the cake. The real issue is recommitting oneself to the spiritual path. And nothing that avoids that issue will ever ultimately satisfy. We also learn that the only way to bring yourself out of the crisis that you find yourself in is by recourse to prayer. Maybe up till now you've said prayers. You rattle off the prayers with great comfort, but with not a lot of emotional investment attached to it. But when you're really hurting, when you're really confused, when you're really out of control, it is then that you realize you have to pray from the soles of your feet up and prayer becomes your lifeline to the higher power. You can't make it without that in your life. And so after we have gone through all this, where are we going on the journey? In a sense, we're not going anywhere because we are just ultimately going to where we've always been, namely children of God. It is just that now we wake up to that fact. The poet T.S. Eliot said, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. There are a lot of forces out there in our world that would not have us believe that this is the case. I think of the story of an eagle that was raised by a bunch of backyard hens. Because it was raised by backyard hens, it never learned how to fly. And then one day, it looked up into the sky and saw this magnificent bird that was flying up there. And it asked the hens, who or what is that? And they said, that is the eagle, the king of the skies. He belongs to the sky. We belong to the earth because we're backyard hens. And so that eagle lived and died as a backyard hen because that's what he thought he was. Well, you and I are surrounded by a lot of backyard hens out there, and a lot of turkeys, too. <laughs> but we really are golden eagles. That's what we are called to be. That is our destiny. When we come back shortly, we're going to have an opportunity to ask some more questions about the spiritual journey. See you soon. for this bus. Now thanks to the Americans with Disabilities Act, the wait is over. And now we have an opportunity for some questions and answers. Yes, ma'am. Father, uh, experiencing for the first time uh, of going inwardly, would you address uh, just how we could go inwardly? Uh, is that to our mind, to our heart? What is happening in there uh, relating to all the maybe anger or uh, frustrations? Uh, we're talking about how they can be turned around. Okay. okay. Good point. Before 
one can have access to one's inner spiritual core, first of all, you have to face yourself. You have to face your mind. You have to face your anger. You have to face all the split off parts of your personality, the parts about yourself you don't like. That doesn't sound like much fun, does it? That's why most of us avoid the spiritual journey. They say that the truth will set you free, but first it'll make you miserable. <laughs> and there is no such thing as enlightenment without the pain that goes along with it. No pain, no gain. That works not just in sports, but in the spiritual journey. So we do have to face ourselves, and we don't, in a sense, really have to look at that intentionally. As we open up to God, God then lets us know what areas of our lives we need to work on. So little by little, things are shown to us that need to be faced. And as we face it, as we let it go, as we accept ourselves and forgive ourselves with the power of God's love, it is then that we have access to our inner core of the Spirit. Chrissy. Um, Father, I was wondering, how can we support people who are going through such this journey and at the same time not lose our sanity and our beliefs? It's important, I think, to give people who are going through a crisis like this a beautiful gift, and that is the gift of unconditional love. You'll let them know that even though they may act, be acting very moody and maybe driving everybody crazy, and they're not themselves, still you're going to love them no matter what. That doesn't mean that you agree with everything that they're doing, but it does mean that you're going to be there for them. Now, there's a paradox here, and that is that when you tell people that, a lot of times they'll bark at you, almost as if they don't want that help, they don't want that support, get away from me. So you think, gee, here I've made myself vulnerable and I've tried to be supportive and I've been rejected. Well, that's what love is all about, taking that risk. So I think that the best gift that we can give somebody like that is unconditional love. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Father Tom, before my 50th birthday came up, I was scared. I couldn't sleep. I was worried. I was afraid of dying. Mm. And I just got so bad for a couple of weeks. So then I finally sat down and I said to the Lord, I can't stop growing old. I can't stop my 50th birthday coming. So I give it all to you and it's up to you. And that's what I did. Uh, but it's the inner, isn't it the inner self that's down in there that has all these fears of growing old and getting gray and wrinkled and all. But my fear was of dying. I wasn't afraid of growing old or getting gray. It was just the fear of dying. I thought everybody after 50 died. <laughs> and that was my fear. Well, I think in many ways it's kind of the outer self that has those fears. It's the ego, in other words that's afraid, and we all have to deal with that. But there is, deep within us, an inner self that isn't afraid. That's the God self that we spoke about. That's the true self. That is the us that we really are in the sight of God. So what we need to do, I think, is to stare down our fears. And of course, how can we do that without the Lord's help? We can't. Because there's no way to rationally talk your way out of that fear. It is then that you hold on to the higher power that enables you to face those pain, those painful things, and then work your way through them. But deep within, we have a self that isn't afraid. That's our God self, and that's what we need to get in touch with. Yes, sir? Father, you speak of these uh, crises as though it were a singular event. Is this a once-in-a-lifetime experience, or can some people expect to go through the crisis several times in their lives? That's another excellent question. There are some people in life who are what one might refer to as smooth evolvers. These are the people who don't have just one big crisis, but they have lots of little mini crises. Every month they have a nervous breakdown. So. <laughs> but before you say, well, that sounds like me, the fact of the matter is that for most of us, we need some big traumatic thing to happen in life 
before we really move in the direction of God. So in that sense, there is like one big turning point for most of us that we can think back on. However, once we've had that turning point, once we have surrendered to God, once we think that we have begun then to be in touch with the kingdom within us all, and we're all set to go out and order our halos, that's when God tells us, hey, guess what? It starts all over again. So in a sense, when we talk about the journey, if we have this idea that we're going one way in one direction, that's a little bit misleading. In many ways, the spiritual journey is like going around in circles. However, there's hope even there. Because as somebody said, perhaps the best image there is that of a spiral staircase. You are going around in circles, but each time you make a little progress. You don't notice it, but maybe other people around you notice it eventually. So that's a very good point, that it's not a once and for all thing. It's not like, well, okay, I went through all this a year ago, I surrendered to God, and now that's it. It's a process. It's a daily process. Thanks for that question. Well, I think we have had some really beautiful opportunities here to look at our own spiritual journeys and to put that midlife crisis in some kind of context. So the next time you see one of your friends who's going through this so-called midlife crisis, you don't have to hit them over the head with it, but just realize that what's really going on there, even though they might not realize it and their therapist might not realize it, is that they are being called to grow spiritually. So give them that love and that unconditional support that they need to help them make that big passage in their life. The next time that we come together, we're going to be speaking about some more things on the spiritual journey, some very different things. We're going to be speaking about how one interprets one's dreams and also some practical steps for spiritual growth for all of us. I'd like to thank all of the audience here tonight. You've been absolutely wonderful. You've asked the best questions in the world. And I just want to wish all of you God's blessings on the spiritual journey to which each of us is called. Thank you. Thank you.